Hello everyone, uh, I'm Jae Sung Jung from Ericsson Research. So I will talk about anomaly detection in telecom network, which is one of the important issues. Uh, so first, what is anomaly in telecom networks? There are many definitions depending on use case. But in general, uh, we can say that anomaly is detected by the rules, generated by domain expert knowledge, of the traffic volume, which is one of KPI. It has a daily pattern, but in the last day, there suddenly comes a peak. Then we can say that this is anomaly because it's different to normal pattern. So detection of this anomaly uh, can make a network operation even better. So in the network structure, this anomaly can happen from either the mobile infrastructure side or end user side. So once the anomaly happened, the signature of this anomaly will be delivered to network operation center through the network. And if we can add an analytics function functionality to the stored data or the network entity itself, then we can provide a better and correct anomaly detection to network operation center. So Ericsson actually provide several analytics solutions to the customers for different, different purpose based on, the data, net, based on the network data. So by probing the information from the user equipment or base stations or gateway or the controller or even contents, then the product is able to collect this wide range of data, like uh, anonymized user information, service application, or device, location, radio. And on top of this data, the analytics solution will run. But this data actually generates a massive influx of time series data stream towards network corporation center. So this massive, massive amount of data is generated due to, for example, a number of KPIs, like, trigger, uh, like a number of trigger types or traffic volumes or number of user, or channel quality, whatever. And also, this is generated by the a number of levels of aggregation, like per cell time series, or per user time series, per application time series, or per, say, user equipment time series. And this kind of diversity will explode as IoT and 5G comes. And this amount of data cannot be handled by the engineers sitting in network operation center. And this is why this real-time anomaly detection is very important in the perspective of scalable operations. So if we, by adding the anomaly detection in between, so we can let this anomaly detection filter out the normal behavior in the network and only report the important anomalies to the network operation center, then they can obtain this observability on the network and they will do cost saving. And taking, by taking on other action on this anomaly, they can enhance user experience as well. So we can say that in this, in this perspective, the anom the one of the key performance metrics in this problem is the low first positive rate. So let me say our problem description in this talk. So we focus on a single KPI time series per cell. So for each cell, we will observe the time series parallelly. And this is a real time, and we observe one value per cell. And we want to decide whether this value is anomaly or not. Here, our, our interpretation of anomaly is uh, a large deviation from the normal pattern. A large deviation on normal pattern, we will discuss that in this talk. But there is a challenge. The first challenge is the noise in time series. And this noise will be larger and larger as the aggregation level becomes smaller and smaller. For example, per cell, per cell time series or higher time resolution will incur the noise. And according to our observation, we observe a lot of cells have irregular repeating patterns due to certain reason. But we want to still find the normal pattern from in this case. So we take a machine learning based approach. So imagine that this uh, green uh, one-day time series curve is a uh, time series for tomorrow, which is not observed. 
but still we want to de detect these two anomaly in real time. So our approach is first, we forecast the tomorrow's time series traffic. Uh, here, the KPI is not traffic for number of users. We focus on number of users in this talk. Uh, we forecast the time series of KPI for tomorrow first, which is depicted in red line. And we subtract this forecast from the original data, then we obtain this blue residual signals. Then by setting a threshold on it, we can detect this two anomaly correctly. So two key, two key questions in our approach is the first, pattern forecast, and second, how to set the threshold. So let's discuss first about pattern forecast. So let me give an example. So for the forecasting, we have to train the pattern first. So let's, 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 uh, let, uh, let me show you the, the pattern training result. So this is the training data, two weeks, number of users at a certain cell. And we can first apply the existing solutions, like a season, so-called seasonal decomposition, which is used in uh, popular forecasting models, such as ARIMA model. So what it, this, the, what it does is that uh, uh, first to choose the seasonality period, in this case, weekly repeating, so we choose week, and we collect the weekly samples from training data, and we averaging them together. That is the seasonal component, which is quite a simple way. But due to insufficient training data, the seasonal component still has a, a large white noise and even overfitting in some time. But this is our approach. And we managed to suppress uh, white noise and overfitting with this uh, only two weeks training data. Here, the red curve is the trained pattern from our approach. And the green behind is the original training data. So how can we denoise this pattern? The answer is that we utilize the other cells data using the collaborative filtering approach. So for, for, for running the pattern for individual cell, we collect the observed time series training data from the every cell in the network, and then we split by, them by days. So we build uh, this training matrix. So each row of the training matrix is one day time series training data. And uh, number, so each row corresponds to one day, one cell. So number of rows in this matrix is num number of training days times number of cells. So on this training data, uh, training matrix, we run PCA algorithm. So we extract the k-principal component from this data, which of each of which express one day time series pattern. So thanks to the similarity between the uh, time series shape of, this, of the group of cells, actually this training matrix has a low rank structure, so we can maintain a small number of principal components. And this component only maintains the important shape in time series, while cancelling out the noise over cells. So once we have uh, training time series data for one day, and doing projection onto this subspace, then we will obtain this uh, pattern of that day. In other words, this pattern is expressed by the linear combination of this k principal component. So this is uh, we use a singular value decomposition technique for as a PCA algorithm. So in this training matrix, we run SVD and we do low rank approximation. So this top k right singular vectors are the k principal component. But we are interested in forecasting, so we further focus on the, the weight for each component for the training days, which is referred to as principal component scores. So this, by multiplying, uh, uh, multiplying the uh, principal component to the training matrix, we obtain this PCS matrix. Each row is k length k vector corresponding to one day and one cell. So let's see how does it look like. So this is plot of PCS for a certain cell. So this x-axis is a day and y-axis is value. Here we maintain eight principal components, so k is equal to eight. 
So for each component, the PCS gives one weight for each day. It looks like having seasonality. So for this uh, weight, we multiply the each component, then we obtain the time series pattern corresponding to each component. Then summing them together becomes a trained pattern for training days. So here we observe one interesting thing, which is that each PCS generates a specific shape in time series data. For example, component one, when you look at the blue component one, then it generates up and down pattern in day. And more interestingly, when you look at component two, uh, the large absolute value in the PCS for component two generates a peak in the evening. So for forecasting, we come up with an idea that we, we want to utilize the connection between the cause of the time series shape, such as uh, weather or the event schedules or to the PCS. So with this idea, we, we build this PCS forecasting model. So the input is the daily attribute, like a day of week or weather, temperature, event schedules so on. And the output is the principal component scores, which is nothing but the weight for each component. So we can collect this P PCS from the training data as well. So with the imp and we can collect daily attribute from the external source. So with this input and output samples, we can train this forecasting model. And with this model for the forecasting for tomorrow, for example, we uh, collect daily attribute for tomorrow, which can be known in advance. Then using this trained model, we compute PCS. And we already have a principal component from the training data. We multiply it, and then we get obtain this forecasting. So uh, maybe one example for this forecasting model can be deep learning. There are many candidates. But still, developing this neural network is work in progress now. Now let's move to the threshold setting. So once we forecast forecast time series pattern, we get the rest year. So we take a simple approach. We build a statistical model on it. Again, we, with the training data, we uh, get the pattern and we get the rest year data, blue signal here. And we just plot the histogram on it. And the red curve here is the Gaussian distribution. And it looks like not well fitted to Gaussian distribution, and this is because uh, this residual data still has uh, seasonality. High noise in daytime, low noise in nighttime. So it's very hard to find the distribution. But uh, if we normalize this uh, residual data by scalar to number of users, and by central limit theorem, we can obtain this Gaussian distribution. And on this Gaussian distribution, we uh, set the threshold with the parameter epsilon. So with this, this threshold, it, so satisfy the property is that the area between this threshold is one minus epsilon. So once we op once we observe a value and register and normalize, and this value locates in outside of this threshold, we can say this is anomaly. So let me show you one test uh, example. So this is uh, again a test time series data number of users at a certain cell. And by running offline analysis with a certain epsilon, we obtain these three labeled anomalies. And we first tried the seasonal decomposition technique. So due to a lot of overfitting and a lot of large white noise, the residual data is again overfitted. So using the same threshold, we obtain eight anomalies rather than three. So we can say this is how high first positive rate. On the other hand, in our uh, PCS forecasting model, we forecast uh, without noise and overfitting, so we op the, the remaining rest year setting threshold, then we op obtain three anomalies, which is correct. So we can say uh, this, uh, our forecasting gives a low first positive rate. So this is uh, another preliminary result over 40 cells. We choose 40 cells, which has a season seasonality, so that the season seasonal decomposition can work. And here, I, I would say this is preliminary because, preliminary because uh, we only, in our PCS forecasting model, we only use a day of week information, which is same information to the seasonal decomposition. And the testing data is uh, one week KPI values. And here, each, in this plot, each 
point corresponds to one cell uh, performance metric. And anomaly labeling is uh, obtained by offline analysis with epsilon equals 0 0.01. And x axis is first possible rate, and y axis is uh, mean square error of the forecasting. And we obtain this uh, performance gain. So this is the summary. So we take uh, key steps, three key steps. First, uh, noise removing by incorporating other cells time series data. And we forecast in KPI using the daily attribute. And we build a statistical threshold on residual data. So there are many questions on it. So first, we want to improve forecasting accuracy using deep learning. And also, we, with this wide range of data we collected, we want to perform a root cost analysis. What is the reason of this anomaly? And anomaly forecasting is another very important issue here. So thanks for listening. So do we have one quick question for this speaker? Over there. <coughs> Uh, the, you are using uh, uh, the PCA linear type model, but actually you're, uh, you're solving the linear problem. But the pattern, it must be the nonlinear, like uh, the manifold learning, it should not be the linear type. You need to have a nonlinear model to get the right pattern, even though you are using the linear. Yes, I agree. So this, in this case, we use a linear. Model, but so then how yeah. affect your prediction? This is must be, I mean, should be take care. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, because your interesting. Because your training set is not real pattern. Sorry? I mean, your training set is doesn't reflect the real pattern, I mean, the, in the data, because you're using the linear, I mean, LDA type uh, model. Uh, I mean, this is uh, just eigenvalue solver you are using. Yes, yes. So it's, it's a linear model. Yes. But you need to have a like a manifold learning approach, which has the nonlinear behavior to take into account. Yes, correct. I agree. I I I, I agree on that. Uh, okay, comment. thanks. Okay. So thank you again. Yeah.